All right. Well, I think people have had a chance to get on. And I have just a little bit after three o'clock. So I think we will go ahead and get started. My name is Andy Schmidt Andrus, and I'm the director at Kaufman Museum. And we're really glad you could come join us for this virtual Sunday afternoon at the museum program. A couple, couple things before we get started. We do want everyone to turn their microphones off. We would prefer that if you, uh, if you don't want people to see what you're up to, then uh, you can turn off your video also. And both of those functions are in the bottom left corner of your Zoom screen. So if you have your Zoom screen up, if, if you would please mute the microphone that's in the bottom left, and then next to that is video, which you're, you're welcome to either leave, your, leave video on or off. And then we will also be uh, encouraging people to leave messages in the chat. So if you look across the bottom, you'll see a bubble. You have to hover there with your uh, cursor. If you look across the bottom, you'll see the little word chat with a bubble above it. If you click on that, the chat function will open to the right on your screen and you can just type something there. So I'll uh, just type something there to give everyone an example. Um, one, two, you can type something and tell us what, what town you're, um, what town you're watching from. Uh, go, you can go ahead and put those in the chat. It's always sometimes entertaining. So uh, again, welcome. And with that, I would like to start out with an acknowledgement of the ground that Kaufman Museum uh, occupies. And of course, this land was originally occupied by Native Americans. And I'll read a short statement that we have regarding that before I introduce our speakers. We recognize that Kaufman Museum stands on the prairie where many original peoples hunted and farmed before the arrival of European and American settlers, particularly the, the Wichita, the Kaw, and the Osage. As you visit Kaufman Museum's exhibitions, if you live nearby and are lucky enough to get to do that, uh, if you visit our exhibitions and outdoor spaces, we ask that you honor the contributions that Native Americans have made to our nation's heritage and commit to respecting their descendants and learning about their rich culture and traditions. And that would apply wherever you are, uh, not just if you're in North Newton, of course. With that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce our speakers for today. We have Pauline Sharp and Florence Schloniger. And they're going to be presenting a program called Our Family Stories, and they'll each be telling about uh, their own backgrounds. Uh, Florence is a retired uh, Mennonite minister. She's served numerous congregations co-pastoring with her husband, Weldon Schloniger. And <clears throat> I'd also like to introduce Pauline Sharp. She is a Ka tribal member and a board member of the Kansas Heritage Society, and also a juried member of the Kansas Alliance of Professional Historical Performers. So she, she travels around the state uh, telling the story and first person story of her grandmother. So with that, I'll hand it over to Pauline and Florence. I'm not sure who's gonna start, um, but go ahead and take it away. I'll mute myself. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> I am Florence Rogers Schloniger, great-great-granddaughter of Heinrich and Justine Groneman. They came from Germany to Homestead in McPherson County, Kansas in 1879. And we sold that family farm in 2019. And since then, I have been researching stories about my family and their connection to land. I am Pauline Eads Sharp. I am the adopted great-granddaughter of Chief Washunga of the Kansa people, granddaughter of Lucy Taya Eads, first woman chief of our people. And as um, they said, I traveled the state doing a, a first-person historical performance of 
my grandmother, Lucy Taya Eads, and that of the, uh, I tell the story of the Kanza or Ka people through her character. We are the tribe from which the state of Kansas took its name. I first met Pauline when I was reaching out about, about the possibility of doing a symbolic reparation payment to the Ka Nation after we sold our family land. And we have become friends. Since then, I have wondered what would happen if we would tell our stories side by side. The disappearance of the Kanza people from Kansas is an undertold story. And even more hidden are the connections between European settlement and a very dark period in the history of the Ka Nation. And this is our attempt to make those connections. Before Europeans came to this land, the Kansa people roamed the plains freely. There was no concept of private ownership, although general boundaries were honored between tribes. The land was a fundamental part of Native American life. The earth was part of their being, part of their self. There was a dynamic interaction between the weather, plants, animals, and water. The Sioux people say we are all related. Everything has life, even the stones. My great-great-grandparents, Heinrich and Justine Groneman, were German Lutherans. But three out of my four grandparents had their roots deep in Switzerland in the Anabaptist movement. They were Mennonites. And because of their beliefs, they had to leave their farms and were banished from Switzerland. And so in the 1700s, many of those crossed the Atlantic Ocean to William Penn's colony in America. Now, three centuries earlier, popes had declared that if land wasn't used for farming or any other uh, European way, it didn't belong to anyone. It was empty land. And if people weren't Christians, they weren't fully human. And so kings of Europe could take land and peoples for themselves. They could discover and colonize lands as if they were empty. They could disregard the humanity of the indigenous people. These combined edicts were called the doctrine of discovery, and they became the laws of the church and of the state. And although my Mennonite ancestors had broken with the established church and refused to be controlled by the state in matters of faith, in this they did not critique the way their culture thought about land in America. It was so embedded in the culture. They did not question it. If land wasn't being used for farming, it was free for the taking. Land was something to be owned. It was important to make it productive. In biblical language, they felt called to fill the earth and subdue it, to have dominion over creation. In prehistoric times, the Kanza were part of a larger group, which included the Kanza, Osage, Omaha, Ponca, and Quapaw. This group migrated west from the Ohio River Valley. They began breaking into smaller tribes when they reached the Mississippi River. The Kanza and Osage stayed together the longest, finally separating at the Missouri River. The first recorded Kansa village locations in Kansas were on the Missouri River, north of its confluence with the Kansas River. These villages were abandoned and the Kansa people began settling on the Kansas or Ka River. There were several villages along this river, including the Blue Earth Settlement near present day Manhattan. Ka Nation is a federally recognized Indian tribe. Our name is written in our language as Kanze. As the second syllable is barely audible, this was shortened to Ka in the early 1800s by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Our official name with the government is the Ka Nation of Oklahoma, but we prefer the name Kanza or Kanza people. In 1673, a map maker recorded us as the Kanza Indians, and in 1861, the state of Kansas took its name from this first historical reference without asking our permission.
We are known as the people of the South Wind. The ancestors lived in earth or bark lodges. There were gardens tended by the women. Even when they lived on the Kaw River, they maintained hunting camps in central Kansas. They hunted buffalo at least three times a year. Once in the spring, then again in the autumn and winter when the bison had their best coat. The majority of the tribe would travel for, for the hunt, leaving behind only those too frail or sick for the journey and a few caregivers. The men were expert hunters and the women would tan and dress the hides to be used for trade. The bison were not just food, they were life. They provided clothing, tools, heat, rope, and even housing. Because furs and robes were the only trade commodities available to the tribe, access to the animals was crucial. As more and more settlers arrived in Pennsylvania, the native tribes saw their land being taken and the French and Indian War stirred up troubles. So my Mennonite ancestors started moving west, looking for new homes where they wouldn't be bothered by the French, the Indians, the English, or now the Americans who were wanting their military service for the American Revolution. They moved from Virginia after the Iroquois, Sioux, Shawnee, and Tuscarora tribes had been forced west into Ohio, to Indiana after the Potawatomi had been removed to Kansas in a trail of death that left 42 dead, half of them children, to uh, Illinois after the back, Sack and Fox had been removed to Iowa, to Missouri after the Delaware had been removed to Kansas, to Iowa after the Sack and Fox had been removed a second time, this time to Kansas, to Nebraska after the Pawnee had been removed to Oklahoma, and to Kansas after the Kanza had also been removed to Oklahoma. Moving for more security, more opportunity, often they moved as a community of faith or an extended family. Many of these moves happened within five years after the native population had been forcibly removed. So although we weren't the ones removing the tribes, we were the ones who were very willing to take advantage of the fact that the military had removed them and that the natives were gone and the land seemed empty and ready for the taking. Prior to the Treaty of 1825, the Ka domain was 20 million acres. The 1825 treaty reduced that amount to 2 million acres. The Treaty of 1846 moved them from their villages on the Kansas River to the Neosho River Valley on 256,000 acres, with the Santa Fe Trail running right through the heart of their home. This was followed by the 1859 Treaty, which removed the thriving trade center of Council Grove from the reservation and they were left with a nine by 14 square mile tract of 80,000 acres. In exchange for the land, they received funds for education and agricultural assistance, plus annuities amounting to $8,000 a year, and the assurance of the President of the United States that this land shall remain for their use forever. Contact with Europeans had brought diseases like smallpox and cholera, some years the hunts were unsuccessful because of terrible drought, leaving the tribe destitute and without sufficient food to satisfy the demands of hunger. Then as the hunting grounds were overgrown with, overrun with white squatters, the Kansa were in desperate and violent competition with other powerful tribes for the prime hunting land. The early 1870s proved disastrous. The winter of 1870 and 71 was so cold, they lost a large number of ponies and could not bring in the usual number of robes and dried meat. The next winter, the last winter in Kansas, few of the tribe took the trail west to Buffalo country because their old grounds were being settled by the whites. 
At the same time, they witnessed their ancestors' graves being desecrated, their prairie land, their prairie homeland was being plowed and groves were cut down. Their emotional and spiritual bond with their land was replaced with pain, suffering, and sickness. By 1873, there were 533 people left and they were forced to go to Indian territory. It took them 17 days to walk the 165 miles to their new home. When they arrived, no provisions had been made for them. Soon many more died of typhoid, malnutrition, and even starvation. To put this in perspective, in 1839, there were approximately 1,600 Kansa. After removal to Indian territory by 1887, there were 193 people left. That is a decline of almost 88% in less than 50 years. This would be equivalent to the loss of the entire US population, except for residents of California. The elders thought they had been sent to Indian territory to die, and they gave away everything they had of value and all of their sacred objects. They even gave away the men's ceremonial dance to the Osage. It was during this time that my grandmother was born in a teepee on the banks of Little Beaver Creek in Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. Her father died when she was five and her mother, who was Colin Potawatomi, didn't have the means to take care of her and her little brother. She went back to her Potawatomi family and left the children with the cause. Washunga was chief and he took them in according to native custom. 60 years after the Louisiana Purchase, the U.S. government was interested in developing its land. Kansas became a state in 1861, and the following year, President Lincoln signed the Homestead Act, which offered 160 acres of free land to anyone head of a household who would develop that land. The same year, Congress passed a series of Pacific Railroad Acts which granted railroads land. In fact, it was a sixth of the land in Kansas for the promotion of a transcontinental railroad and the leftover land that did not uh, have the railroad could be, they could sell for the continuing development of the railroad. Everywhere there were advertisements to come to the most fertile fields of Kansas. As far away as Germany, recruiters were hired to facilitate the immigration of farmers to America, to the Great Plains from similar climates. My great-great-grandfather, Heinrich Gronemann, must have been enticed by this opportunity, especially since he had six sons who might want to farm someday. He bought 320 acres of McPherson County land from the railroad in 1879. This would have been only six years after the Kanza people had been removed from the state. This is the farm where I grew up. A spring fed creek runs through the pasture that still has the scars of buffalo wallows, but the bison had already been removed when great great grandpa showed up. Only four years before, a McPherson County newspaper reported, the last of the shaggy monsters in this county was killed this week. Recently, we discovered that an offshoot of the old Caw Trail came right across our pasture, proof indeed that it was part of Kanza hunting grounds and their hunting camps. My ancestor was part of a great migration of European farmers. Five years earlier, 64 Mennonite families from the Ukraine had arrived in Marion County bringing their winter wheat. The railroads had wooed them, had moved all their belongings, and in preparation built them two long immigrant houses to accommodate through them through the winter months before they could build uh, houses and barns. 
the contrast to the lack of provisions provided for the Kanza people when they arrived in Oklahoma is astounding. More Mennonites from Russia quickly followed as they saw their religious freedoms being threatened. In a few years before great -grand great great grandpa showed up, nearly 10,000 Mennonites had settled on the Great Plains. The US government did everything to promote European settlement. Part of the homestead and railroad agreements were to cultivate the land so that there was nothing left when the original residents came back. The intentional slaughter of bison was meant to keep the native peoples off the land, off the homesteads on their, on their seasonal hunts and to deprive them of their livelihood. These are the hidden policies, the hidden policies that we don't like to talk about. In an attempt to assimilate Native Americans into white society, boarding schools were established. Children were taken from their homes at a young age, sometimes forcefully, and sent to these schools for an education. Their hair was cut, they were punished if they spoke their native language, and they were given white names. They were forced to abandon their identities and culture. Kill the Indian, save the man was the idea behind boarding schools. My grandmother, Lucy Taya, was sent to Haskell Institute in Lawrence, Kansas in 1901 at age 13. Her younger brother, Emmett, joined her there three years later. Lucy stayed at Haskell until 1908 when she was sent to the German Hospital of Brooklyn Training School for Nurses in New York City at age 19. For over 80 years, US federal law banned Native Americans from practicing their traditional religious ceremonies and even outlawed traditional regalia. Ceremonial practices went underground and possessions were hidden. It was not until 1978 that the American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed. Though many indigenous peoples were conver converted and left our ways behind, there is still a strong tradition for Ka people. Despite a long history with Christian missions, I have been to events where traditional ceremonies are held and some of our people participate. In, by 1885 in Kansas, high schools were being mandated in any county with 6,000 people or more. Mennonites saw the handwriting on the wall. On the wall. One leader wrote, if we cannot give education to our children in well-guarded schools of our own, they will go into other schools and get it, and many of these will be led astray, and we cannot expect more than a small percentage of these will return to the church. Therefore, we must provide an institution controlled by the church. So in 1909, Heston Academy first opened its doors. The decision was to locate in Heston because it was a rather out of the way place where there are not so many inducements to lead the young astray. My great great uncle promoted the school and my father's second cousin was part of the first faculty. My maternal grandparents both came to the school in 1919 and when their five children became teenagers they moved to Kansas so that they could get a Christian education. My roots go deep at Heston Academy, now Heston College. My uncle, brother, sister-in-law, son, and daughter-in-law have taught or teach there. Others worked as support staff. I met my husband there. Its vision was to deepen Mennonite understandings and spiritual practices to preserve our religious heritage and to prepare us to be leaders in the church. I acknowledge that I was sheltered, that I had no idea that I was unaware of the people who walked the prairies before me, and that they were educated to take away their identity while we were building schools 
to strengthen ours. In exchange for land, the ancestors were guaranteed annuity payments. As their land base shrunk and gain became scarce, they had to use this income to purchase the food and clothing. When funds ran out, traders and merchants would extend credit to them when they received their, their next payment. As debts rose, they had to sell yet more and more land to cover their loans. When they were forced to go to Indian Territory in 1873, they had to buy their new reservation from the Osage. They had to wait eight years for Kansas to pay them for their land. And when they received it, the agreed upon amount had been reduced by almost 40%. After removal, the Dawes Act divided Kansas communal land into allotments owned by individuals. Guardians were appointed by a court to help individuals with their finances until they were declared competent to handle their own affairs. Often the guardians were corrupt and stole from their wards at will. Today, Con Nation keeps individual history cards on tribal members. Lucy's uh, brother Emmett's card shows that he was granted a certificate of competency in 1914. Lucy's card does not show her ever being declared competent. They sold the allotment farm they had inherited from Washunga in 1914 to her guardian, who was an attorney. In the early 1920s, the Osage were being murdered for their oil head rights. Even though the Ka didn't have head rights, they were scared. They were afraid of losing their land. They needed a leader to help them with business and to deal with the government. In 1922, they elected my grandmother Lucy, chief of the Ka's. She had the skills they needed at the time. She was educated, spoke excellent English, and owned a business with her husband, John Eads. She served as chief for 12 years. Lucy went to Washington, D.C. to look after the rights of her people in 1924. She made several requests on behalf of the Kansa people. They were all denied on the basis they were contrary to the allotment agreement of 1902. This is when they first learned that they'd given up their rights to be a tribe when they signed that agreement. Lucy sold her, her allotment farm in the 1950s. This was the land, last land owned by the Eads family. As far as I know, nearly all of the land owned by tribal members in Oklahoma was either sold or stolen. My great-great-grandfather, Groneman, came to this country and very quickly was able to own 320 acres. He built a house and a barn, and in the 1895 census, we see that he added 160 more acres to that, as well as his three older sons, who each had bought 160 acres for themselves. When he died, his son, Grant Adolph, who was my great-grandfather, bought out his brothers and sisters and built a new two-story house and a granary. It must not have been easy because over several years they mortgaged that land about every six months. But there was always the possibility of a loan. There were lenders who would float them money so they didn't lose the land. And they scrimped and saved and bought more land until it reached 1,200 acres. Adolph and Minnie had one daughter, my grandmother, Lena Rogers, who inherited all of the land except the original half section that great grandpa had willed directly to my father. And dad and mom raised us five children on that 320 acres. Over the years, he added six buildings to house implements and animals and grain. And when grandma went to the nursing home, dad, her only son, inherited all of the accumulated Groneman land that was now passed down undivided for four generations. I am the fifth generation. There were dry years, but we always had enough to eat. There was a big garden where we grew vegetables and meat grazed on the pasture. 
there was a farm crisis in the 1980s, but by then dad had inherited all the land and it was there as collateral and enough that some could be sold. When I was in high school, I and my four siblings each inherited were willed 40 acres by my grandmother. It put me through college. The privilege that land afforded me was the lifeblood of the call, and it was systematically taken from them. It wasn't until 1958 the resolution was drafted to establish a Ka Nation constitution. The resolution was not approved by the tribe until 1975. The first constitution was not adopted until 1990. Connation owns several hundred acres of land in Oklahoma. All but a five acre cemetery plot had to be purchased. Connation also purchased land just southeast of Council Grove near the site of our last home in Kansas. In 2002, 168 acres was designated as Oligawahu Memorial Heritage Park. There's a monument on the property that was built in 1924 after the remains of an unknown Indian were discovered. Below the monument are the stabilized ruins of the 1861 stone building built for the tribe's interpreter. We invite you to walk the two mile long Kansa Heritage Trail that loops through the park past the bronze plaque of the Ka tribal seal and the stone ruins of some of the 138 huts the U.S. government built as dwellings for the Ka in 1862. One of our tribal members described this as the first HUD project in the U.S. In 2013, Ka Nation was awarded a grant from the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism for a dance arbor and improvements to Oligawahu Park. The arbor was dedicated in 2015 and we danced on our own land in Kansas for the first time in 142 years. Today, we have 3,585 tribal citizens nationwide, but our last full blood, William Mahuji, died in 2000. We have been self-governing since 1990. We are one of the largest employers in Kay County, Oklahoma. Our revenue comes from state and federal grants, the Brayman Travel Plaza, and three Southwind casinos. We offer Kansas citizens services such as clinical health and dental, higher education assistance, environmental substance abuse, domestic violence, and child-related care. There are Kansas language classes for adults and an immersion class for the children. Cultural activities include the annual Washunga Days Powwow in Council Grove, Kansas, and the Ka Powwow in Oklahoma. The Voices of the Wind People pageant is performed in Council Grove every other year in September. It tells the story of the Santa Fe Trail, Council Grove, and the Kansa people. We got the men's ceremonial Eloshka dance from the Ponca in 2000. It has taken us many years to reach the point where we are today. Each generation has had its challenges. Today, the Ka are virtually invisible to the citizens of Kansas. Many people believe we no longer exist. We are not recognized by the state as an official tribe in Kansas. The Kansas Heritage Society is a nonprofit 501c3 entity dedicated to educating Kansans about who we are as a people, that we are the original inhabitants of Kansas, and that we are still here. Our organization was founded and is fully managed by Kaw Nation citizens who work closely with the tribe for the preservation, protection, and perpetuation of our culture, history, and sacred sites in Kansas. Our organization is supported by generous donations from conscientious citizens like you. We provide support and assistance for the upkeep and educational interpretive programming of Oligawahu Memorial Heritage Park in Council Grove, culture and tr traditional pro programs and activities, such as ceremonial ka dances and initiatives such as the stewardship of the Big Red Rock in Lawrence, Kansas. 
In April 2019, I attended the Flint Hills Wisdom Keepers near Campful Grove. It was profound. There were 11 or 12 Native American elders sharing their traditions, wisdom, spirituality, and friendship. We watched the 2015 documentary, The Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code. Before it began, Sheldon Wolfchild, Dakota actor, director, and producer, talked about the movie. On his website, Wolfchild says, the film calls upon the Pope at the Vatican to revoke the papal, papal decrees that set into motion the domination system and points out that the values and teachings of our original nations are a sacred path for all life. Wolfchild said that he was able to go with a group of 10 Native American elders for an audience with the Pope. He said that all of the Protestant churches have repudiated the doctrine of discovery and 80% of all nuns support this as well. The Pope has still not signed the document. One of my favorite quotes is from the movie, The Last of the Dogmen. What happened was inevitable, but the way it happened was unconscionable. Although nothing can be done to undo the wrong that was done to indigenous people, some descendants of settlers are seeking to more fully understand the harm caused when their ancestors settled on the prairies. Today, some Anabaptist leaders have come together to form a Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition. Mennonite Central Committee has developed a training manual to understand the doctrine of discovery and how it unconsciously and consciously still guides our ethics and behavior in this country. They also offer a simulation called the loss of Turtle Island to show the impact of US policies and European settlers. Every other year, Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana, Anna offers 11 day trail of death pilgrimage that retraces the 1838 forced removal of more than 850 Potawatomi people to Kansas. It is a time of learning and remembrance and lament. Across the US, there is an increasing interest in reparation payments to native tribes. Besides one time gifts, some are matching the amount of yearly real estate tax they pay and matching that as a reparation payments to the tribe who first lived on that land. The forced removal of indigenous people caused harm and trauma that touched all parts of their lives. It also hardened the humanity of those who disregarded and participated in that harm and it resounds down through the generations. Although my ancestors were either oblivious or rationalized the pain caused by settling the land, I think we dare in this generation to look at the stories we carry and examine their truth. We have the advantage of hindsight. We ha can stand back and look at the bigger picture. We need to listen to the stories of the people who have been harmed. We need to acknowledge the cost to native peoples. And we need to reflect on the consequences of a domination system that puts wealth in the, in the hands of a few and exploits the natural world when it wants production at all costs. In the prophets of the words of the prophet Isaiah, when we do justice, we rebuild the ancient ruins. We repair the breach. We can raise up the foundations of many generations. Well, it has been a privilege to be with you and thank you for listening. I think that finishes uh, what we have to say, Andy. Yes, thank you so much, uh, so very much to both Pauline and Florence. And uh, we've already had questions uh, popping up uh, in the chat over here. So 
if you're both okay with that, I'll just launch right in. Um, there was a greeting from Charlie Huffman to you, uh, Pauline, and I hope you got to see that. And then Brian Stuckey had a question uh, for Pauline. He asked, could you talk more about the significance of the Red Rock in Lawrence and its current status and plans? Yes, um, this has been an ongoing project, oh gosh, for many years. Um, the Big Red Rock ended up in Northeast Kansas. It was pushed down to Kansas by the glaciers over 700,000 years ago. Well, there are many, they call them erratics in, in Northeast Kansas, but this one happened to end up upright in the Kansas River at the juncture of the Kaw and Shunganaga Creek. And it was, the, the Kansa people would go there and pray to Wakanda. It was uh, like a church for us. Um, it was even recorded on our prayer chart in the early 1800s. And they, it says that they would sing five songs to the big red rock. So then after removal, um, of course, you know, we didn't really have access to the rock anymore. Uh, in 1929, the, the city of Lawrence, uh, well, actually Topeka first wanted the rock. They were going to move it to Topeka for some exhibit on, on glacial, glacial erratics. And at the same time, Lawrence decided they wanted the rock uh, to celebrate the founding of their city 75 years before. So they they got a crane from the railroad and went and got the rock out of the river and moved it to a small park in, um, near the Kaw River and called Robinson Park, where it has sat now for 90 years. And it has a plaque on it um, to the founders of Lawrence who founded this town in righteousness. And um, there's no mention of the Kansa people or uh, that it was sacred to us. So um, over the years, the, the story of the Big Red Rock has come up several times. And usually somebody's researching and they run across, you know, something that says it was sacred to us. And so then they, they um, reach out to Ka Nation and get a statement and something's in the paper and it gets discussed and then it gets dropped. Well, so finally, um, Actually, I heard uh, Dave Lowenstein is a, a mural artist that lives in Lawrence, and he was did a presentation at Bethel College, and I went and listened to him, and we had discussed this like five years before when I was on the cultural committee with Connation, and we tried to do something then, and it didn't work out, and, but when I saw him at, at uh, Bethel College, he said, you know, I think this might be the time to bring that up again. <clears throat> so he he said he was going to apply for a grant um, to start the conversation and so that everybody is aware of what's going on. And so we, before the pandemic, we were able to meet with um, the community probably two or three times in Lawrence and ask for community participation. Uh, I think our first meeting had over a hundred people come and overwhelmingly it, the people said, well, what do the cons of people want to do? So I presented uh, to the Ka Nation a couple of times. And at, at the last meeting, um, they voted to ask for the rock back. So um, they sent a formal letter to the city of Lawrence. And now we are um, waiting on a formal response from Lawrence. Uh, we have, we've met with the, the mayor and the vice mayor and uh, we, kind of, we have a kind of a verbal commitment that the rock will be returned to the Kansa people. And it, it's our intention that, well, I, I thought the Big Red Rock has been in Kansas for 700,000 years, so it should stay in Kansas. Um, so we've talked about moving it to Kansa land in Kansas, which would be Aligawahi Memorial Heritage Park. So um, that is our intent. And we have a website if you want to follow the progress of, of the project. It's uh, Robinson Park 1929.com. And there is a, a 
frequently asked questions page on there now. Um, and you can, can see where we are in the project. Um, we, we're going to apply for a grant, hopefully, to, to help fund. We would like to reinterpret Oligawahu Park and move the rock and reinterpret Robinson Park. So it could be a, a big project. Um, so that's where it is today. I hope that answers your question, Brian. Hey, and um, I see Charlie just put the link to that website, to the Red Rock mm -hmm. website in the chat. So if anyone wants to uh, go to the chat, copy that, and then you can look it up. And I, I did just have it up on my screen, and there's a picture of the big Red Rock. <laughs> yeah. So that's nice to see. Okay, we have um, another Brian, this one, uh, Brian Ewart. Um, and he's wondering whether Bethel has an, an endowment scholarship fund for Native students. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if there happens to be anyone from the Bethel College Administration or Admissions Office on online right now uh, that would know the answer. I guess if you, if you are online and you have the answer, you could add it to the chat, but I do not know the answer to that right now. Okay, and another question. This is from uh, Ron Dietzel, and he says, what's the relationship between the Kanza and the William Scully Land Management Company after the vast land purchases of 1870 to 1885? Funny you should mention that. <laughs> My husband is Doug Sharp, who is the Scully agent uh, for that estate. And, um, uh, other than our relationship, there is no relationship um, between the Kanza and the Scullies. But he knows our story well. <laughs> okay. And then um, I actually had a question. And what uh, you mentioned a couple times giving a dance, or you said you got a dance from someone. And I wondered what that means. Are they there? Uh, well, not exactly copyrighted, but uh, what does that mean when you give someone a dance? Well, when our, you know, when the, when the elders thought they were going to die and they gave everything away, they gave away our dance to the Osage so that it would be preserved. And along with their ceremonial drum. Um, so we were without that dance because we had given it away until Gosh, the early, I think maybe 2004, around that time, um, they were able to get the dance back, the men were from the Ponca. And I, I asked uh, the president of the Kansa Heritage Society, why, why did we get it from the Ponca when we gave it to the Osage? And he said, well, you can't get it back from the people you gave it to, you have to get it from somebody else. So the Ponca were gracious enough to, to give the dance to us. And so you, uh, the Kanza were not allowed to perform it until they got it back. So it's kind of a- Yes. Uh, right, pro, uh, yeah, a property issue almost, except it's not land. It's a, it's a concept and a gas uh, dance. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from uh, people out there? We've had a lovely crowd today. We've had about 100 people listening. Any other questions? Here's one. I have a great, great grandfather whose family moved to Pratt um, County, Kansas from Missouri in the mid 19th century. Do you have recommendation for where to begin learning more about the people who were displaced from the specific places my family lived? Oh gosh, there, I recently saw a place where you can send a text to a number and from your location, they will tell you who was, who was there, but I, I can't. There's also a website that you can put in the name of your town and your, your county or your town and state, and it will tell you who the people were that lived there. Uh, and I don't have that readily available, but um, I, I don't know how we could get these things to you, but um, how would you suggest, Andy? 
Uh, we can put it in the chat and then a question for Becca. Does the chat stay up also, uh, Becca? Like if people want to reference references that are in the chat, does that stay up in addition to the recording? Do you know? Uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. The chat's not available, but I did copy some links and a few questions and answers in the Facebook comments on the Facebook Live page, which will host this presentation. Um, and that's just facebook.com slash coffin museum. So um, if everybody got that, Becca has been putting some of these references into the Facebook page. So, um, so that's one place you can go. And then I see Heidi has a comment there. She has the link for the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery website. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Heidi can um, do that. And then there was a question <coughs> earlier about how to access the recording and what Becca just said, facebook.com slash Kaufman Museum. Um, and then let's see, uh, uh, Rachel, uh, Pan Becker kindly uh, did some research or knew off the top of her head that Bethel College has a Millennium Three scholarship. So this is back to the question about uh, from Brian Ewart about scholarships for Native Americans. And this Millennial Three scholarship is in honor of ethnic and cultural diversity on campus given to selected students based on academic criteria, uh, leadership abilities and potential for success in college life. So indirectly that would be be available to Native Americans on the Bethel campus. Here's a question to Coffee Museum on Facebook and Bob asked, are we doing more of these seminars? Let's see, we will be having uh, two more programs coming up. Both of those are going to be during um, our Kansas Day celebration, which is on uh, January 30 at 11 o'clock, uh, Glenn Ediger, a uh, local historian, uh, will be doing a program on Mennonite ethnic food. And then at two o'clock on the same day, Jenny Messias, the, uh, one of our Coffin Museum board members, is going to be doing a program about uh, Mexican-American immigrants Mexican immigrants to Newton and specifically about railroad history in Newton. Uh, so those will both be on January 30. So that's what we have coming up. Let's see what other questions we have. Is there a reason the Pope hasn't repudiated the doctrine of discovery? Do you know anything about why that's stalled? There. I see Pauline shaking her head. Oh. I'm gonna back up a little bit. Uh, we're wondering about the land, the, I think this applies to the gift Florence gave. Have there been any copycat land transfers? Um, this was not a land transfer. I don't believe Connation is set up for land transfers. It was a cash gift. Uh, and Pauline, there have been more, right? Um, yes. Um, in fact, Florence's brother, Ken Rogers, matched her donation. Um, and then at the end of last year, um, somebody else matched that donation, Stephen Wanda Schmidt. And we have, we've gotten... Um, many donations ranging from $10 to $5,000. And I've already gotten some in 2021. Great, we're glad to hear that. Yes. Okay. It amaze me, <laughs> I have to say. There's a question here, I'm not quite sure who this is too but can you repost the information on the 11 day journey to retrace the trail of tears 
Yes, out of AMB, out of AMBS, our Mennonite Seminary. I can do that, and I can also do uh, the the map that the link to the map that shows where you where the original tribes were. And you had something, Pauline, for that also, right? Yes, uh, yeah, I can post that on Facebook. Okay. Yeah, and you can either go ahead and post it, or you can get it to Becca, and she'll make sure it, it's on there. Okay. Any other questions? This has been incredibly interesting. And saddening. <laughs> yeah, it's a sad story. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll, I'll mention that this program and the programs uh, that will be coming up on January 30 and the one that we had uh, on back on December 13 uh, with Jean Chavez on the history of the flour tortilla in Kansas. Um, all of these are a part of our current special exhibition called Cross Crossroads Change in Rural America and that's a Smithsonian exhibit that's here just through the 17th of January. So just one more week that you can come see that Smithsonian exhibit. We did uh, create a companion exhibit a called of land and people and <clears throat> excuse me that one will be up into February and so that will be here after the Smithsonian exhibit comes down uh, so those two exhibits are up we'd encourage you to those of you that live close to come sometime in the next week it's up through next Sunday the 17th till 4 30 and our hours are on our website Okay, there was a question, um, oops, I'll back up just a little bit there. Uh, from Kate on Facebook, thank you for the ideas and how can we approach reparations and take other actions? How has knowing this information you've shared today affected your own church leadership or daily activities? I guess that's a broad question for anyone that knows other ways or from Pauline and uh, Florence, other ways to approach reparation or other ideas from people in our viewing audience, um, how it's affected their own daily activities. We have had an, an inquiry um, on from someone that wants to uh, put something in her will uh, to leave a donation to the Kansa Heritage Society. She says she didn't have the funds right now, but um, she would like to do it that way. And so that's another idea on, on how to make reparations. Um, I, and I see a question about donations to the Kansa Museum and or library in Kansa City, Oklahoma. And I would suggest donations to them be made directly to uh, Con Nation of Oklahoma. And I can put that address on Facebook Live page also, or send it to Becca. I, th I think the most important thing for me has been really learning the history and, and having my eyes opened to the history. And that has been really, uh, really important and, and keeps changing my life ongoing, I think, going forward. Um, I think just understanding the doctrine of discovery and how that impacts uh, all our treatment of peoples, not only the stealing of land, but the stealing of labor with African Americans. Um, and Th that has impacted me a lot. And I suppose just building relationship with Pauline has been so healing. And to gradually learn to know other members of the tribe, to go and dance with them um, at their Washanga days, that has, it's, it's been very healing um, for me as well. And I, I think there is a kind of damage that's done to our souls when we find out that we have 
participated unwillingly in this, uh, you know, as generations, uh, that somehow our whole history has been a participant in this. Um, and, and so um, that has been healing also just to, to know someone and to develop a friendship. Along those same lines, I'm curious whether the uh, dances at the new dance shelter, I'm not sure uh, if that's actually a ceremonial shelter that is built out uh, at the park, if those are open to anyone and how you find out about those. Um, our annual powwow is Washunga Days um, when Council Grove has their mm -hmm. annual celebration. It's always or typically the third weekend in June. And um, yes, it's open to the public and we you are all invited. We would love to see you there. And how about out at the park? I, I can't remember the name of the park now, um, where there's the, the edifice of the old building. I, I happened to be walking there, uh, encountered all of that and walked down by the shelter there uh, all before I knew anything about this. So it's come together <laughs> nicely for me just in the last six months or so. Um, but I'm curious about events there, if those are closed or if those are open. Uh, no, that's where the powwow is held. Oh, it's held there. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Didn't know that. And that is uh, Alagawahu Memorial Charity Park. Okay. That, is, that is the park. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Ali Gawahu was uh, the last Kansa chief in Kansas before removal, and that's why it's named after him. And we have a um, suggestion there in the chat from Ken Rogers, who uh, Florence mentioned also has been contributing, and he said, consider writing a check every time you pay property taxes. Uh, that'd be a... a ongoing reminder that the land we own is a sh is a, just a short part of the history of who actually has lived here for many, many uh, years. And then there's a message there. I'll go ahead and read it just in case anyone isn't accessing the chat. It's from Charlie Huffman, supporting our um, educational funds, supporting indigenous artists, listening to our stories, supporting curriculum changes for your children and grandchildren. Um, to help indigenize education. That's a great one. Uh, so much is left out of the history books. Uh, working in partnership with the land and indigenous people, amplifying our voices, voting for indigenous candidates. These are all ways to begin the process of reconciliation. And I will mention there are lots of thank yous there from Rose, from Raylene, from Lorna, from Rachel, from Donna. Um, oh, and here's a question that I, oh, you got that question already, um, Steve, uh, lots of thank yous there in the chat too. And I do show just a little bit after four, um, so I think we will uh, call an end to this for today, but we appreciate all the active questions coming up in the chat and of course appreciate so much Pauline and Florence uh, taking the time to prepare this presentation and spend time uh, giving it to this Kaufman Museum audience. So yes, many, many clapping hands then there for you. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation.